Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from Toronto in Canada by Adam Levinter. How are you doing, Adam? Good, John. Good to be here. Excellent, excellent. And Adam is the founder and CEO of Scriberbase. Uh, he's a recognized subscription expert, author of The Subscription Boom, and speaker on the subscription economy, customer loyalty, and the future of commerce. And that's what I wanted to talk to today about is, number one is, uh, Adam, the subscription economy, if you just want to kind of define that for people who may not have heard of that term before, or you know, those two combined, just give us a kind of basics. Um, what is the subscription economy? Sure. So subscriptions mean different things to different people. Um, if you ask your grandmother about subscriptions, she'll probably say, oh, what, like magazines? Mm -hmm. um, in our world, we define subscription economy by the entire universe of businesses that are driven by recurring revenue. That could be subscription, membership, paid loyalty, um, any sort of as a service or software as a service type of model, um, mm -hmm. it's really all encompassing. So when we talk about the subscription economy, it's it's not just magazines. It really runs the gamut of all businesses that are driving recurring revenue. Yeah, thank you. Now that's that's uh, that's excellent and very helpful. So um, I, I feel to some degree, Adam, that a lot of businesses and, and people kind of defaulted into the subscription economy because, as you said, you know, software as a service, for instance, uh, you know, when that became a popular model, obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot of businesses in that. But I'm not sure if people always understand how to optimize a, a subscription business in the first place. They just think it sounds great. Recurring revenue sounds great. And uh, so how do you actually, how do you approach a subscription business, say software as a service, uh, a, a business like that in, in an optimum fashion? Well, look, what I tell businesses uh, and what I tell CEOs is it's really difficult to make a business work at scale when you're selling something once. Mm -hmm. In order to succeed, you need to sell something several times over. And subscriptions are a great way to do just that. So if you think about your traditional brick and mortar retailer, that CMO has to go to great lengths to market to and attract you back into the store after you've purchased something. With a subscription model, you've now shifted the onus to the consumer side. And the customer is deemed satisfied with that particular offer, service, or what have you until they cancel mm -hmm. and the company on the other hand is just going to assume that you are satisfied as a customer and bill you month over month or every year or whatever the cadence may be until you cancel so it's that fundamental shift in business operations that i think is so compelling yeah and um, one of the and obviously the the big challenge with that part is is i mean obviously attracting the people in the first place, but then it's, I mean, getting their attention, but then the next part is, is retention because, you know, let's face it, Adam, today, we're very quick to switch out things. Uh, we're very, you know, if we see a comparable service or seems comparable, maybe it's five bucks cheaper, we'll pop over there. If we have no relationship or connection to the brand. Yeah. And subscription is a great way to have, that recurring touch point with the consumer and of course build on that relationship like i said when your relationship with the consumer and vice versa is purely transactional there is no relationship component to that transaction you're way less likely to develop that relationship over time subscriptions on the other hand provide that recurring touch point and of course deepen the relationship retention is still a challenge for a lot of businesses and that's a big part of optimizing the model but ideally, you get there from the get-go by having a subscription model in place and scaling it effectively. 
Mm -hmm. And then, and then, like you said, is uh, is building. You've got those touch points and that, so you need to obviously build on that and keep their attention and keep them connected. Because, like I said, I mean, I have I have signed up subscription to you know business to business uh, services who I've never heard from the people. So when it came to switching out for something else, I'm like, yeah, I have no relationship. I don't care. So I guess it's it's obviously very important for subscription businesses to really focus on those touch points and and in the things that make them sticky what we see actually is that companies underinvest on the retention side so if you think about two sides of the subscription model there is the acquisition and there is the retention side of the business acquisition is where companies tend to overinvest mm -hmm. in time and in resources because of course that's where all the marketing happens that's where the sales happen you're driving consumers down the funnel and then of course they transact what happens though, is that once that credit card is captured, those companies tend to forget about the customer over time and they don't focus on what we call customer journey uh, or life cycle management. And they're under investing in customer retention, they're under investing in customer service. But of course, it's a lot more expensive to acquire a customer than it is to retain one. So why wouldn't you invest equally in customer retention? So we see the battle being lost on the retention side, actually. Yeah, no, I, no, I would, I, I would agree with you, and I think um, you know part of that is that, uh, as you said, I mean the overinvestment in acquisition, but also then the over reliance on you know maybe on technology and kind of taking a very hands off approach when it comes to uh, servicing and supporting customers, and and like I said, therefore, oftentimes the best relationship you build with the brand is when you need something from them, when you have a cust when you have a support issue or you have a service issue or whatever it is, and and a lot of them have kind of put that so far at an arm's length that. Uh, that it becomes a frustrating experience rather than an opportunity to delight. Well, we recommend to meet the customer where they want to be met. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, we advocate for omni-channel customer service. That could be email, that could be live chat. Um, but that also means live agent if your customer expects that. I can't tell you how many times I've tried to contact a company and there's no toll-free number to call. Um, depending on the size of the transaction, a lot of customers want to speak to a human being. And we see companies under investing in that, and I think that is a shortfall. Yeah. So, what are what are some other what are some other strategies that a subscription business can adopt in order to you know not just retain customers, but but to grow customers to turn them into advocates? Um, we talk about referral marketing or referral economics a lot. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the third side of the coin. So th the two most important components of the model. And any companies that we speak to will understand the difference between customer acquisition and customer retention. And they'll often talk about best practices related to both. Where they don't seem to focus at all, and it's quite surprising actually, is what on the referral side. So once you have a subscriber, how do you incentivize them to tell other people about you? Um, there's a huge benefit to word of mouth marketing and referrals. Um, and it's quite shocking actually the companies don't understand this so if you think about it once you have a subscriber once they become loyal you have the potential to turn them to your point john into advocates meaning that they start to talk about your company your brand your service to other people if you can incentivize that customer to do that effectively what ends up happening is you get customers signing up or subscribing to your product or service at a zero customer acquisition cost. Mm. And we know the name of the game here is optimizing for high lifetime value and low customer acquisition cost. And I can talk about metrics related to LTV to CAC because some people refer to it. Yep. Um, if that's of interest, if it's too in the weeds, we, we can pass on that point. But the point is somebody talks to their friend about your company, your service, your subscription, that friend signs up they're now a part of your subscription and there's a zero dollar cost of acquisition associated with that customer not only that the quality of that cohort is going to be way higher than your default cohort that is subscribers that are coming in the funnel through you know paid media or other mm -hmm. forms of marketing because let's face it you trust those around you you trust those in your network 
So John, you're a smart guy. You talked to me about some amazing subscription that you've just signed up for. I'm going to take you seriously. Yeah, and and I think that's something that's uh, you know that is still underestimated. But just what you just said there about referrals, it kind of struck me is because oftentimes when you sign up to something like it's you just get an email which says, "Oh, refer somebody and get twenty five dollars," or "Refer somebody and get this," or and it's so rote and kind of impersonal and. And it's not, it's not when you become an advocate for a brand, you're not doing it for that reason. You're doing it because you're excited to share the ideas. So when you just get this rote email that says, oh, you know, and it almost comes immediately after you subscribe, like here, refer somebody, get $25 gift voucher or something. Okay. So this is the art and the science behind Mm -hmm. referral marketing. So the science, you know, we understand that referral economics is important. Um, There are metrics related to low cost of acquisition and the power of word of mouth and all of these things. But to your point, John, how do you get people excited to talk about your brand, your service, your product, your subscription to other people without it feeling inauthentic, without it Mm -hmm. being, being annoying? Not only annoying for them as the referrer, but they don't obviously want to come across um, as annoying to others around them. Um, and that is sort of where the art comes in. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do you do that? Well, one way is you you have to focus on a referral program that's authentic. you got to face it. Nobody wants to be treated like an affiliate. No one wants to feel like an affiliate. It's weird. Um, so how do you do that? Well, you have to create a program whereby your subscribers actually feel like they're sharing something valuable with a friend with a colleague if they value this product if they value this service and it inflates their status by telling other people about this particular program they're going to feel way more compelled to talk about you and it'll do it and they'll do it excuse me in a lot more uh, of an authentic way like i said nobody wants to feel like they're an affiliate marketer Mm -hmm. so psychology comes into play here um you know it has to be there the other piece i would talk about and i've talked about this in my book um is the power of storytelling you know dollar shave club did an incredible job at the beginning um, by focusing on a story that others could tell their friends about prior Mm -hmm. to dollar shave club there's nothing interesting for men about buying razors absolutely nothing Um, Why would you talk to your friends at the water cooler about the razors you just bought at Walgreens? There's nothing interesting about that. But because of the viral video, because of the subscription component, $2 Shave Club, because of the sort of fraternity feeling associated with the brand, this was something interesting that guys could tell their friends about and feel kind of cool in doing so. So it's there's a little bit of psychology at play. There's a little bit of sort of status inflation at play. Um, but you have to incentivize people to share in an authentic way that makes them feel important. Yeah, and I think that's the key thing is the authentic piece because uh, you know, let's face it, we're we love we love to be able to share things with people. We love to be able to say, "Oh, look what I discovered! This would be fantastic for you as well." Um, and that's kind of in you know that's innate in us in many ways. But uh, but it has to be you know we have to feel that connection we have to feel that trust with the brand in order to share it because at the end of the day is if you're asking somebody for a referral you're asking them to put their trust on the line a hundred percent and you made me think of a word i don't know why i didn't think of this earlier you know i talked a lot about status or inflating one status and the psychology at play ultimately everybody wants to feel like an influencer Mm, yeah (laughs) this is the influencer economy Um, Why wouldn't we want to feel important? Why wouldn't we want to show something to a friend, to a colleague that we think is cool that we're a part of? It's just human nature. Um, What are what are some examples you've seen of you mentioned like Dollar Shave Club, but what are some other examples you've seen of 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 companies who do this really, really well? Um, That's a really good question. You know, I think there's a piece of community that's really important. Mm. So brands that double down on community and understand the power of building a community have higher lifetime value from their subscribers. So for example, Peloton, um, you know, we call it a hybrid subscription business because they're selling a piece of hardware, which is a one-time purchase, 
But in order to maximize the use of that piece of hardware, you've got to subscribe to the app so that you can get access to the classes. What's really interesting about Peloton and why they have really high lifetime value from their subscribers, um, and let me be clear, this has nothing to do with the stock price. So mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of naysayers say Peloton's a crap company, the stock's done terrible. The stock is not the company, the company is not the stock. I'm talking mm -hmm. specifically about the subscription model in Peloton's business as it relates to this particular topic. So they have incredible retention, they have high loyalty, they have high customer engagement. Why? Well, there's nothing that interesting about a spinning bike. What's really interesting is the ability to share this experience with others to get your friends to join a class when you join a class, to compete against family members and share data. All of this deepens engagement. And the value is not just from the company to the customer. It's not one directional. Mm -hmm. It's actually multi-directional. And the power of community lies in the company's ability to have its subscribers or members get value from one another. If the company can do that, you have an incredibly powerful community strategy at play. For example, on the other side, there's, you know, if Walmart wanted to create a community, they're going to have a terribly tough time doing so because there's nothing interesting about me sharing the coupons I got on, you know, toothpaste or the savings mm -hmm. I got on shampoo with my friends. There's no value exchange there. But Peloton, there's something to get really excited about after you know i subscribe and you subscribe john and we start competing against one another um mm -hmm. another example you know tesla has done a great job at community uh, creating community as well um not necessarily a, a subscription business sure. but um just to highlight the point that i think a lot of companies are focusing on this yeah and i know i think that's a great point and i think community is is such a is such a powerful it's such a powerful thing difficult it's i mean it's not easy to create as you know i mean lots of people try to create communities um but i think that's where a lot of brands don't invest enough time or energy in figuring out that post sale that that ongoing that connecting connecting their customer base in in such a way that it becomes almost self perpetuating um, it's not e easy to do, right? Like, let's yep. take another example, um, Spotify, which is mm -hmm. a default subscription business that a lot of consumers will understand because uh, many listeners will already be subscribers. They're doubling down on community by trying to give subscribers the ability to curate their own playlists, to share those playlists with their friends. Um, you know, they're, they're doing their best to double down on community and figure out a way to deepen community um, around the idea of music. So we'll see where that goes. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, and then, you know, the point of where it crosses over into being annoying when somebody keeps sending you their Spotify playlist and or whatever, and you go, I don't like your stuff. Right. <laughs> Stop sending it to me. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting. So what, um, what, what other um, last piece of advice would you have to a, a subscription business, maybe something that's uh, that's also overlooked that maybe should pay a little bit more attention to in 2024 and beyond? Well, I think if you are a services business, you can be thinking about a couple of different things. So let's break it down from a high level into three different business models. If you're selling products, you're going to fall into one of two buckets replenishment, which is the Dollar Shave or the Honest Company or the Amazon subscribe and save model. These are typically consumable products. You run out of them every mm -hmm. 30 days. Why not mm -hmm. automate the purchase and delivery cycle of diapers or peanut butter? Mm -hmm. um, on the curation side, lots of product companies did the whole sample box thing, the wine clubs, the cigar clubs, things of that nature. The biggest bucket and the one that's continuously growing and the one that's about to take the market from 200 billion where we are today to 1 trillion by 2027 is the access model. Mm. This is where all of these services businesses live. Um, the sa software businesses, the dating sites, the gym memberships, the as a service models, the you know Amazon Prime loyalty program type of model, the streaming services. Um, this is where access to something exclusive that's gated behind a paywall becomes the default. Um, and if you're a services business, you can think about 
what can we develop where we can sort of create an ongoing service of some kind um, perpetually uh, and curate some sort of a subscription model around that. So we're very excited to see where the access bucket goes. No, no, for for absolutely, and obviously, I mean, the nice thing nowadays is that you're, you know, generally speaking, depending on what you're, depending on what you're selling, of course. But I mean, your your markets are almost like global now for subscriptions. Uh, obviously, depending on what you're what you're selling. Um, so, listen, Adam, this has been fantastic. But I wanted you to uh, just give us a moment and tell a little bit more about you and your business. Sure. So, Scriberbase.com, like a subscriber, but without the sub. Uh, we start scale and optimize subscription businesses. Uh, we do this for big corporations. We also do this for startups and scale ups. We are global experts in subscription commerce and you can find us online. And if you want to connect with me, the only place I typically hang out is on LinkedIn at mm -hmm. Adam Levinter. And we'll have all of Adam's information below this video. So again, thank you, Adam, for the insights. Thank you for watching and listening. And I will see you all again very soon. Thank you. Yeah.